Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. And one last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by 10th man, Paul Hall, Arwin, Flatsoid, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Good afternoon. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Any signs of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as the curve of the Earth? Not from Mesquite, Nevada. Uh, oh, geometric horizon, where art thou? <laughs> when we cannot see the... <laughs> <laughs> Owen's been on top form the last few weeks, it's got to be said. <laughs> that was good, that was good. Well, the paradox thing is going to last at least six months, Owen. You'll get kudos for that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the paradox, any evidence of the R value, Earth radius? No, no, most, no don't even know where it is. Yeah. Now, everything that's supposed to be proving a radius in some way, like even when people say, oh, GPS proves it. No, no, no. GPS actually uses a very extensive and complete Euclidean geometrical database. So, Big yeah. shout out to Brian. Uh, the plane geometry. Yeah, basically. You can assume a tangent plane, though, when you're doing geodetic surveying. You can say, I assume based on the WGS84, for the sake of argument, that my position on the surface of the Earth is thus. That is my tangent point. It's my point at the top of the radius, when I assume a zenith that moves to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. And from there, from my assumption onwards, I'm going to use a Euclidean principle to measure the actual ground. That would be to say it's flat. So beyond their assumption of a tangent... But how does that... Go on. But how does that work? You already said you have a tangent. Is that already assuming you have a radius? Yeah, exactly. The thing that Craig, the, fight the Flat Earth guy, fell foul of. You know, I asked him if they were measuring a tangent plane. He dodged the question about five times and then later declared that they're measuring a tangent. <laughs> I.e. assuming a curved surface beneath a straight line, the tangent point. That is to beg the question of a spherical Earth. Moving on, any scientific evidence of gravity? Oh dear. There's actually no evidence for gravity. Well, wait a minute, what's gravity? What is it? What thing are you talking to speak of? There's a man who knows the right question it's, to ask. It's a renaming of the relative density theory and then basically an, in, in, an initiative to mind experiment some details about actual relative density out of it. And then, yeah, then the whole heliocentric fantasy starts and all that. Yes, correct, Arwen. Taking greater density, calling it specific gravity, and adding a G to it. Yeah. So, no scientific evidence. Yeah, it does lead people to make some pretty silly assertions, though. Like, gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls in a fish tank. Yeah. What? Very Those special. <coughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for those 2,000 mile an hour uh, bouncy balls. I'm still waiting. Any I'm single. I'm still waiting to see smoke fall. Smoke go down, go boom, boom. Yeah, everyone's got to act like Spider Man when the house sets on fire. Get on the roof, man. That's where it's going to be at. No smoke at the top. Not on the roof, sorry. Uh, on your ceiling. 
That's what they would assert, right? Gas go down, go boom, boom, 9.8 meters per second per second, right? No. Stuff goes up as well. Maybe assume buoyancy, you know, just beg the question all over again with gravity. Moving on. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? No. But I think some of them are spending some time on writing papers on how to debate a flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we covered that yesterday. Yesterday's show and the show before it were both epic, really good shows. I listened both back on the second channel. Subscribe today, Nathan Oakley channel, where you'll get the uncut and after show a couple of days after it actually gets recorded. If you're a member, you get it immediately. So become a Nathan Oakley member today if you want to keep up to date with the flat earth debate on your own schedule. Anyway. Yeah, they, they, that was what there was covered, good shows right? And... Space.com. Oh, sorry. No, no, I'm saying that. You, you go on. I'm, I'm saying yes, that's what was covered on yesterday's show. We covered the Space.com. How to debate a flat earther. And it starts at the horizon, right, Arwin? On you go. Yeah, it pretty much does. But they take a lot of time getting to that point and then thinking it's this massive reveal. That's how it's presented. But I, I watched a, a very late night stream yesterday from Rodrigo Ferrari Nunes who went through it for like three hours, like the entire thing, and dragging him some other pieces. And it is just astounding how much time they spent in basically trying to spin doctor the reader through it all in this just childlike suspense of disbelief. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, we're in a control. Oh, look at this. We're sounding so smart. And then just having all only disproven arguments. like. That all things that are just like five years out of date, eventually, when the parlor trick is ended. It's hey Brian, ridiculous. You got, you got a shout out a minute ago when we were talking about tangent planes. What? Hey Nathan, oh. hey, how are things here, bro? Hey Brian. And I yes. guess uh, Brian, you started your own business, your own airline company, the tangent planes. <laughs> yeah, <tent. laughs> tangent. Sounds like a bad band. <laughs> Don't it? Well, let, let me just bring bring clarity. So, while it had been explained to me on numerous occasions, it was Brian that was concise enough to make it clear what I just explained two minutes ago. You take your point on a piece of Earth that you're standing upon, and then take a model, either Earth centered, Earth fixed, or WGS eighty four. It doesn't really matter. One that assumes a spherical surface or a squashed. <laughs> anyway let's not get into that that's the tangent anyway God, why did i have to use that word that's a deviation from the subject we'll get on to tangents in a minute but brian made it clear that when they assume that they've got a zenith when you're standing on your bit of ground moving to the center of a presupposed spherical earth and you say well my zenith is here therefore i'm pointing to the center at this angle that's going to be the point that i assume i'm stood on a tangent plane now, the tangent bit is their assumption that they're pointing with their zenith to the presupposed center. And if you're looking at the view that I've got on screen for the audience, you know, if we're up here somewhere in England, when the other half was actually in place, then down here somewhere, you could potentially be, I don't know, in South America or wherever. And you're going to assume that you're antipodal to where I am and your zenith points to here. But from that point on, you then assess the land that you're actually surveying as a plane with Euclidean principles. Anyway, that was my leading view, Brian. Do you want me to say something else, Ash? Or just bathe in the glory of excellence that is your concise explanation for this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, you know what it is? It, it's such a simple thing, that, uh, and the borderers make it a complicated issue with the way they try and explain it, because they don't obviously can't understand it because they're thinking it's, it really is the case. You know, when they say reciprocal zenith angles, it's, it's like, it sounds like, oh no, so, so kind of overwhelming to people. But it's just, it's just a mathematical pre-assumption. That's all it is. You know, if you pre-assume where you are that there's a, a zenith above you going into the center of a, of a sphere of a particular size, the same is happening to me here. We both pre-assume these things. We can mathematically work out that these angles are, that the zeniths are at a different angle, that they're not parallel. You know, that's all it is, isn't it? Yeah, so you assume hey, that I, I start at point A, 
And I say, Arnosphere, I'm here, and my zenith points to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth, like the map says it does in this model or datum. And then over there, 100 miles up in Scotland, he's pointing different towards the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. He's further over the curve. And therefore, the line between me and him isn't a, a parallel. It's not horizontal. It's curving between the two of us. That's why we've got different presupposed zenith points pointing towards different angles when assumed that you're pointing towards a spherical Earth from the top of your head going down to the ground. But they're just assuming that. You know, it doesn't actually do anything other than leave tards that we debate with to say <laughs> horizontal's curved or straight lines are bent. You know, just double speak that... It, when you hear it from an outside point of view, you just laugh. But if you're an, a normie, you might hear that and go, how does that make sense? Surely it must make sense. Well, no, just your surveying process assumes a sphere and therefore the two points between them must be curving, even though you're going to be measuring them flat. Nathan, did you yeah, hear Brian's? And, and, uh, so no, one no, second, no. I just want to finish off on what Nathan said. Sorry about this. Uh, the, the, the worst part about it is that if I was in Scotland, let's say, and you were in London, let's say there's 200 miles between us or something like that, then we do the exact same thing. So we both pre-assume that our zeniths are going to the centre of, of a sphere with a radius of 3,959 miles. Then mathematically, we'll believe that our zeniths are, are divergent. But we then, around these zeniths, if we're both surveying, we then will create a four-quadrant Cartesian coordinate system. And then for us to meet in the middle, we will create other co uh, car Cartesian coordinate systems to meet between those two. And they all have to work on a flat plane. So we'll be working on a total flat plane with, things that, with, with a coordinate system that cannot work in any other way. It cannot work on anything other than a flat plane. It's designed that way. It cannot work on, any, it cannot work on a constantly curving surface. It, it has to work. It's a grid system. It can only, all, all, all the, all, every part of each one has to be the same dimensions. So there's no way for it to work on anything else but a, a flat plane. Yeah, but the way uh, they get it. We'll still create all these and still say, oh, the zeniths are divergent. Exactly. It's the zenith. So, so as soon as they move over to the next grid, they start by saying, my zenith is now pointing to this point on the piece of spherical Earth. Now let's map out the flat plane next to the lawn we just surveyed, <laughs> and it's all just flat. But ultimately, each time they move over one square, they presuppose that they're pointing at a different angle towards the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth, based on a datum that they look at. And they say, we're supposed to be here based on where the datum says we are. And that point on the datum points to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth, thusly. However, now let's move forward and measure how flat it is, <laughs> assuming it's a plane. Yeah. It's another paradox, isn't it? Because you're you're lay, you're surveying it flat and presuming it's a curved. So it is another paradox. Yeah. Sorry, Tent, about that. Yeah, and no, it leaves I was them say you go on. That, I just I just, uh, I just uh, run that, uh, and then you can go, Tent. Hold on. It leaves them making those paradoxical assertions. Straight lines are bent, and they literally will say that. Go ahead, Tent. Yeah, uh, Brian put up a video of one of the ballers uh, admitting how GPS works. And just pretty much said everything Brian said. Remember that one? I don't. Oh, yeah, it was Jesse Kozlowski. Yeah, the Sophia. Yeah. Have yeah. you played that, Nathan? I, you ought to play it. it. it we'll get Brian to tell us, talk us through it. It'd probably be better as he reminisces. Should we do the violins? Woo! Woo! <laughs> so Jesse and Jesse yeah. keep running oh. away from me, though. Yeah, they, they did the same with me. They, they just do that with everybody, you know, that. That's what they do. They, they just want to get you onto somewhere like Jose's and then have Jose mute you while they spew a lot of nonsense. You don't get the reply. And then, you know, it's nonsense. But uh, no, what, what, what it is, I just took an audio from Jesse Kozlowski did a presentation on Jose's going back a couple of months ago now. And he, he admits in that, he, he, sa he says it, the GPS, uh, uh, the native uh, coordinates coming out of a GPS unit is Cartesian. So it's a box style system which uses a rectangular system within it for coordinates finding or whatever. But it's a box style system. Like he, he says it, he, he says it's not latitude and longitude. That's a conversion that happens afterwards. But I just took that bit of audio and I just looped it over and over and I put some, put some um, diagrams and stuff on the screen to go with it just for people to see exactly what he's talking about. Can you stick a link in yep. Master B or wherever? 
So yeah, I'll do it now. I'll throw in the link there in a moment. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, while you're digging that out, I'll rattle through a few more housekeeping questions. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? No, another reification of some thought experiment. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields? I oh, know I've already had that one, hasn't I? Uh, any evidence yeah. you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? I'd like to see them try. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Not in Nottingham. Afternoon, guys. Hey! Hey, <laughs> hey Adam. Hey, Adam. Of course, it's a Thursday. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> what time is it? Two o'clock. You got a glass of wine yet? Uh, no, I'm having a coffee first, Nathan, but uh, I will be doing later, yeah. Fair enough. You can you can help <laughs> us out with the, the last tile scheme question, I think. it's uh, Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Nope. Nope. Right, nope, Brian, nope. how are you getting on? He's searching through his own stuff now. He can't tell me because he's on mute looking through it. <laughs> so I, don't, don't, I won't disturb him. Hopefully he'll post it in a second and then we'll discuss it. When I've got no chocolate here today. Doesn't look like it, does it? No, I'm just looking there. Oh, well, I'll wait. Hurry up if you're listening, chocolate. I've got you some good news. But I'll save it till he's here. Fair enough. There we go. Right on. Yeah, it's a in it. Perfect, perfect. It operates in a 3D Cartesian coordinate system. So here's the thing I wanted to explain. GPS operates in a 3D Cartesian coordinate system. It is not latitude and longitude. That Latitude and longitude comes from a conversion from that box style system. That's the native coordinates coming out of a GPS system. So here's the thing I wanted to explain. GPS operates in a 3D Cartesian coordinate system. It is not latitude and longitude. That latitude and longitude comes from a conversion from that box style system that's the native coordinates coming out of a gps system a 3d cartesian coordinate system <laughs> epic thank you for sharing it i'll put the link to it in the chat so hopefully a few people will go and bung you a subscribe i've been unsubscribed both 10th man and you brian lovely means i get to circle it with a red button and show that i'm clicking on it though and that action will hopefully encourage others to do the same for both you and 10th man thank you so now, well, he pretty much admits uh, that all their uh, GPS works off of a flat plane, and then they have to convert it, refi it into a sphere somehow. It, it's not just GPS. All supposed co uh, satellites, co let's say all supposed navigate, all supposed satellite systems, all coordinate systems, which involves maps also, any kind of military maps, all these kind of things, they all use Cartesian coordinates. They all have to use Cartesian coordinates. Airplanes, you, uh, aerospace use Cartesian coordinates. Like we would say if we were using the XYZ system, X would be east on the ground, Y would be north. And Z is always Z, but Z is, is up. But for airplanes, X is north. Z, uh, uh, sorry, X is north and Z is Y. No, yeah, well, no, it's not that. It's, it's not that they're not using triangulation. <laughs> I, I, one second, I just let me explain this a second to the audience. On the ground, the XYZ system, right, X is to our east, Y is to our north, and Z is, up, is above us, right? With aerospace, they have to change that around so they don't make any mistakes. So there's no, uh, there's no, there's no, um, there's no, mis there's no uh, confusion. So they have X, which is, would be to our east. If you're in aerospace, it's to the north. Y is there east, and Zenith is down. So we have east, north, up, would be ground-based Cartesian coordinate systems, whereas their ones is north, east, down, would be the aerospace Cartesian coordinate systems. 
So just that they uh, they're all using Cartesian coordinates, all of them. They never for, don't use Cartesian coordinates for, for the visual uh, navigation, military, aerospace, surveying. Everything is Cartesian. But, but, Sorry, but for the, but for the benefit of explanation for the audience, so when when, that, when this is being described with a box based system, the presupposition that you've got a zenith to the centre would leave you with a disco ball, lots of little flat squares. However, that's not how the actual system lays itself out. It's only the assumption of the surveyor based on the datum, and the datum's already sort of done and dusted. So the actual surveying is, as Brian's describing, this box system. But the presupposition would leave you with a disco ball, right, Brian? Shout out to Retro Bill. Uh, go ahead, Brian, and then I'll, I'll shout it out when you're done. Well, Brian, can I just clarify just for myself? So are you saying that... They're using triangulation to calculate it on a standard Euclidean bit of geometry. So they, they use that and then they calculate your position from there. And then the computer program in the GPS then plots that into a globe model. But what it doesn't do is calculate in a non-Euclidean way. No, it's the other way around. Brian's drop, dropping in and out, so I think he's got an issue. You start by ass assuming based on a datum that's already set where your position is before the surveying even begins. So you're not figuring out where you are. You're telling yourself where you are based on your presupposition of zenith that goes to the centre based on the datum that you look at. Then you start your survey. No, no, I'm just on about the, just the GPS system, just in how it's calculating. It's calculating flat. Um, it's not calculating, so it's not taking the pings and using those within a, a sphere map. It's taking the calculations from the pings on a flat map, calculating the position, and then re-overlaying that calculated flat position onto a sphere. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, and give you the, and then therefore translate it to um, longitude and latitude. I, I missed some of that because I, I my audio went out, dropped three times. But I think what uh, your, uh, Adam was talking about is the conversion from Cartesian to larger, longitude and latitude. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. So the conversion occurs after calculation, after after measurements of position. Measurements of position are done on a flat plane, calculated um, from the pings, and then from that position that's generated on a flat map they then reconvert that into a ball with longitudes and latitudes based on yeah, relative that position relative conversion points not actual calculated on the ball was it called yeah that's that's correct that's correct no 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 i didn't know if we were finished on that sorry uh i caught on there a second ago i thought you were finished uh, no that's exactly what they do because what they do, let's just say uh, me and Adam are, are both surveying and we're using what's known as total stations. Total stations are like an advanced version of a theodolite. And they can do different things. I won't go into all the details. But one of the things they do is they put, they automatically put the coordinates of where you are using the zenith into what's known as polar and then Cartesian coordinates. Now, polar are flat earth only as well. If you want to use polar coordinates, they're flat earth only. Uh, they actually use basically a, a box type system but they're using they use angles but they're only a 2d system a two-dimensional system so then when they get the elevations and stuff they, they convert the whole lot to uh, or they, they it's the, the coordinates are given in cartesian now a lot of people especially on the ball side don't realize that polar are actually flat earth only as well they don't get that they don't understand polar uh, coordinates they mix them up with what's known as spherical coordinates because they use a similar a similar uh, system for that but they are all the spherical coordinates have been taken from the center of the earth in their model, the center of their belief. Whereas polar is actual coordinates taken. It's just basically all polar coordinates is, let's say Adam is there with his total station. He's taken an angle to a place. And this is just an angle. And then once you have that angle and the distance that it's going in, with the total station, you have what's known as an EDM, I think it is, where they, they can, uh, they can uh, through sound, I think it is that they... Uh, um, uh, it's like a radar they can tell what distance someone or something is from them yes, it's uh, so right. radio waves radio waves yes right radio waves so they um 
So they take an angle. Let's say Adam takes an angle to his right at, let's say, 32 degrees. And it's something that's, let's just say, I don't know, whatever, distance away, 500 meters. And uh, then he has that point away from him, from where he is, is his zenith, and he has that point at that angle away from him. And then well, when they start taking elevations, they then take that point and turn that into a Cartesian uh, uh, coordinate system. Uh, with, like the, basically, it converts it to a Cartesian coordinate system within the total station. Um, I won't go into all the details about it, but it always starts with polar and Cartesian with total stations. Always. And what it is then, is I'm doing the same thing at a distance from Adam. And then the data from both those total stations is put into a computer unit or a data collection unit. And then, once all the data is collected, then all that data is then mathematically being converted to sphere. So what happens is we get loads of, it's like there's a flat earth map, be, uh, not of the oceans, but of the, um, of the lands uh, that are being surveyed, made all the time. But they keep on converting it to, to geographical, which is uh, spherical, latitude and longitude. So if they weren't converting to latitude and longitude, then all our coordinates would always be flat out. It's only the conversion that takes it away from, from flat out. You know, so that, that's what they do. But because they do this in, in sections all the time, because surveying is always done in sections, they don't just survey the whole world at one time. So what they do then is they took all these conversions and they, made a, a, they take all the conversions and they make a globe map out of it. This, they uh, originally converted to the AE map or some flattening of, a, of an ellipsoid, a flattening of the WGS84 or the NGS80 or something. They, they just make a, it's just the, a, the, the, the AE map. The, 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 uh, the one that's on, for people that don't know what I'm on about, the one that's on the uh, United Nations flag. Yeah. And that's basically what they work off then. They work, like, like when they're using uh, coordinates, they often have to go away from the actual spherical and come back to the AE map just to use uh, latitude and longitude. And they, then they have to go back to Cartesian when they use it with like the likes of Google Earth, has to go back to Cartesian, uh, but it doesn't show it that it's doing it. Because you get a position with it in Google Earth, you open up Google Earth, you hover your, your mouse over something, your pointer over something, something, it gives you your latitude and longitude, but it also gives you your elevation. But you can't get elevation with latitude and longitude. It's a, that's a two-dimensional system that's taken off of the people looking up in the sky at the stars. It's two-dimensional. So they have to then convert, go back. Like Google Earth is constantly going back and getting its elevation from the original Cartesian coordinate systems. If you know what I mean, that's all. So it all has to go re revert, but they just hide that it's all revert. You know, they can't do one. Latitude and longitude is useless on its own. Just a quick shout out to Retro Bill. He says, "Fruitful discussion this week on FE debate. Worth every penny. Thank you very much indeed for your support, Retro Bill. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Brian, for detailing this." Yeah, I, I have even more something that just just while we're on it, just. I just cut in on him. I'm sorry, Ted. I know it's the second time I've done it today. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, this is the last time today I'll do it. Uh, just uh, uh, what, what uh, something flat I said earlier. I said, are, are, are they not using triangulation? All, just for people to know it though, all uh, computers, smartphones, tablets, right, you know, iPads, whatever, none of them are GPS, right? They all work off of cell towers. All your supposed GPS coordinates are coming from cell towers. They're all being triangulated by cell towers. Um, GPS units work off of right, what's known as the core system. There's a, there's a system put in place for uh, surveyors who are using this GPS type system. I think before anyone else was, it was after military, they were using it. Um, and this core system basically is a system of towers that just give uh, coordinates to surveyors. So if you've got a GPS unit, whether it be in a vehicle or a GPS phone or whatever, then you, you, you will be getting a lot of your uh, coordinates from, these core, from the core system, which is just towers again, just land towers again. So they say GPS is trilateration, which is basically there's, rather, than tr rather than there's three locations pinpointing you, there's four and more pinpointing you and they're using microwaves rather than uh, microwave uh, let's say high frequency as opposed to low frequency waves or whatever or medium frequency but like 
there's no uh, basically you go as far as you as you can to find out the origins of these frequencies and you get as far as the core system and you can't get past that you know where's the core system getting their frequencies from you know we know they're not getting them from space so basically it's just a big load of triangulation and trilateration and they make it sound like it's from satellites in space can you spell it because no offense to your irish accent the what system Oh, sorry, course, C O R S, core system. People can research that. Surveying cores, C O R S, C for cat, O for ordinary, uh, R for, for, I don't know, uh, right, and S for snake. Perfect. You struggled on what to give an R for. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't take that but R. <laughs> R for radius. Right, another quick, so quick shout-out. Out from Ireland. Just another quick shout-out to Rodney B. I make topo maps using GPS. Brian is correct. Well, wow, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm very informative. Really appreciate it, Rodney B. So was Brian, it Adam uh, who was last? Oh, we've been waiting for 10th man for ages, though, eh? 10th, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Adam brought up a point with uh, non-Euclidean. Chocolate showed us a homework assignment the other day for a child who uh, uh, was doing homework on the Internet, and it talked about an orange peel. And when you take the orange peel out, it's, you can't make it flat, uh, but when you put it back together, it's a ball. So this uh, non-Euclidean conversion is the opposite of that orange peel example, which was ridiculous uh, because they're trying to say it the opposite way. So can you touch basis on that? So since they get everything off of a uh, uh, you know, Cartesian coordinate system, right, the grid system, flat, plane, everything, they're the ones making it into an orange peel. And to do that, they have to jump from Euclidean and come up with some other geometry. So they say it's, oh, non-Euclidean. Is that, am I right there? I think he's asking you, Brian. I've actually got those those questions that were posed to this. I think it was in like a, a Skype education session or something like that. And the, the kid just literally took pictures of it. Um, was it bro, you, Brian? No, it was chocolate, wasn't it? Yes, it was chocolate that sent this message. Um, but I've got that on screen for the audience if you want to answer that last question, Brian, from 10th. He dropped. Oh, he's he gone. He's got, he's got internet issues at the minute. Well, it would seem like that's what they're doing, uh, obviously, because uh, if they're using Euclidean geometry with the Cartesian and plane and tangent, but then they have to convert it, just like Kozlowski said, you know, longitude latitude is an afterthought, but we don't get it that way. We don't get it from a ball. We get it from a flat surface, and then we have to convert it. Well, they can't convert it using Euclidean because you don't have straight lines, you don't have parallel lines anymore. So it has to go to some yeah. other geometry. Yeah, well, you see, their problem is as soon as they um, make the triangle more than 180 degrees, then they've already thrown Euclidean away. They do this. Right. Was that your point, Adam, when you asked that non-Euclidean question? Well, I was just I was trying to ascertain how it's done. So from what I heard there, the way in which the system works is it assumes a flat plane uh, to take the measurements. It takes the measurements and then calculates position on a flat plane. And then to use your orange analogy, after they've taken that flat piece of paper, they then do what they do. And it's kind of the opposite of the orange to me because you're going to get crinkled. Um, they then... Do what they always do, which is just wrap that uh, flat map around it, the ball shape. So they then transfer the relative positions into the non-Euclidean. But none of it is measured or calculated initially in that system. It's only done afterwards, and then that includes the conversions to longitude and latitude, which are so. Yeah, it's already it's already preset. Well, just be specific, Adam. Conversions from what to what? So conversions from the flat map that, and the flat calculations and the flat measurements uh, to then give you a position on the flat map 
and then take that position on the flat map and convert it to its relative position on the ball. So to summarise, you're saying the ball isn't measured, it's <clears> merely converted, and it's converted from flat, correct? Yeah, yeah. Not it says just the flat map, but calculations and measurements that are assumed to be taken by the computer on a flat plane. Fundamentally, that's what I'm hearing, that the, the computer's processing that initial data on in a flat world. Okay, so let's give the full discussion summary. So you go from, you're in your car right. with your sat-nav, it gives you a position based on flat box coordinates, and the transmission hasn't come from a global positioning system, it's come from towers. However, when it gives you a, land, a longitude and latitude line in little numbers at the bottom right-hand corner, that's a conversion that's been done after... The measurements, which have been taken from a flat plane in the first instance, and then at some stage for other maps, converted into a sphere. But to give you those numbers, it's just taken the original flat measurements, flat maps, flat box construction for the system that's laid out on the flat plane, and then giving you some numbers that relate to a sphere. That was my understanding of what Brian said. He's back. So is that is that right, Brian? <laughs> Hopefully you heard the summary. You're still there, Brian. Hey, yeah, sorry. I'm having to say on the four problems. Yeah, that's exactly it. That, that is, uh, for, I came in just as you said, talking about getting your coordinates, being in your car. Yeah, that's it. It's that's that's the basics of it. They want to complicate it, but that's that's what it is. Well, I'm glad you corrected me, Adam, because I was I was misunderstanding how he's translating this in terms of the GPS system. Because I was just listening to his surveying answer. But yeah, you correctly identified that. No, he's not. He's not identifying that in terms of how they come to the measurements, but how they apply them in terms of people's understanding of what they see on their screen in a car sat nav or on a phone for the sake of argument, right? Yeah, that was what I was trying to see if that's what Brian was saying, which is fundamentally brilliant. <laughs> the calculations are flat. Um, Shout out to M for just giving me money in the super chat. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate it. And I reiterate what I don't know about the whole week, but certainly Tuesday, Wednesday and today's show have been really, really good content pack shows you know and in all of them i think even if it's been like a quick cursory last question we've got all housekeeping questions in the last three days as well so i don't know i've been i'm very very pleased uh, again plug for myself sorry to interrupt everybody's nice flow of flat earth information um if you're a nathan oakley 1980 channel member check out yesterday's show there was a an off topic not on flat earth discussion um at, in the after show um, but also, if you want to keep up to date with the Flat Earth today, debate, the shows, the after shows and pre-shows go out immediately after the recordings are finished. Now, today's pre-show was 10th Man's video. Now, you can just go and see this. I did post the link at the beginning of the live show. So if you scroll back through the chat, once it's rendered, you'll find the link to 10th Man's uh, video that we played in full in the pre-show and then react to it afterwards. But it was it was brilliant. At one point, I put my camera on to show the goosebumps I had as I was listening to him. So it was truly, truly excellent. But it, like I say, for the last three days, all of the shows have been really good. And I, obviously, I do say so myself. But nevertheless, you know, I'm not going to be the first to say when there has been a series of really good shows. So hopefully people are watching them. Um, shout out to everyone in the live audience. Sorry to disturb the flow. But yeah, smash the super chat. Become a Nathan Oakley United States channel member. Oh, oh, you might you you might have three more new members after uh, a little follow up. <laughs> I doubt it. You've shared, I'm sure I'm sure I might get a, might get a subscription out of one of them if I'm lucky. Well, it all depends how I follow up. <laughs> but the, the the first you know you were Morpheus. <laughs> you didn't. Attack <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I mean, they gave me their phone numbers, so they gave me something that they normally wouldn't give unless they trusted someone. So uh, what's what's the next step? Hey, subscribe to this channel and uh, follow what I follow, and we have something to talk about that'll be current. I mean, how hard is that? Yeah, I don't know. Lower your expectations. Perhaps they are normies. All right, let, let's take some uh, fun bets. Uh, Adam, what do you think? Do you think I could get two out of three to join at the end of the day? He wasn't here for the conversation, but feel no, free to have a random guess. You'll have to fill me in on the details a little bit, Tenth. Um, 
Well, what happened was I had workers on the property, uh, the little lag in their work because their boss wasn't here. I was in that kind of mood of, I got to go talk to these people. So I said, hey, I have a YouTube channel and we're discussing the nature of the earth. Uh, can I interview you? I won't say your names. I won't show any pictures of you. Just ask some basic questions. They all agreed. Went through the interview, went, lasted 12 minutes. At the end, they gave me their phone numbers. They wanted to see the material I've been looking at because they found it interesting, challenging. And I sent them last night Nathan's interview with Mitchell and Paul on the plane, that one they did last week. And uh, today I will send them the rendered version of their own interview. I obviously have a means of contact because I got their phone numbers. They trusted me, at least for that. So how hard could it be to get two out of three of them to subscribe to Nathan's show? What's the odds? Oh, just as well. Yeah, I think you've got, if they're engaged and were genuine and they went to an interview, I think, I think that's, that's good odds. I thought you were talk, more talking about um, getting them to renounce the ball. <laughs> no. So that's, that's a harder task, two out of three, but... I could recommend well, they, that for them. I know, you know. Well, they're at least challenging uh, what they've been taught based on how they were responding. At least two of them were. Yeah. Well, listening to it, I would say at least two of them should all probably join. One might. All right, Nathan. The other one. Did you I'll recommend... follow up and let you know. Well, just <laughs> make sure you let Spurs know. <laughs> <laughs> the psychologist. Well, just more of his. You can keep tabs on how many people have been converted. Me, yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> beyond the show content, you know, I, I, I'll shut up. I'll just cause offence. Shout out to Henrik, who also just gives me money in the super chat. Really appreciate your support. Thank you very much indeed. Well, joining your show may not equal conversion, but it opens up their mind to different ways to view the earth. I, I, I'm going to say nothing here, so there's going to be dead air because all I'm going to do if I reply to this is cause offence. I would, I would stay. Away. I was being a little tongue in cheek um, with the announcing, but uh, conversion, I think, is a is a an odd phrase in of itself. It's not one that sits comfortably with me anyway. I think the best I ever hope, and well, you can hope for it because we don't have an answer, and that's a lot of the trouble when you are talking to newbies is they, they want a replacement paradigm so the aim certainly when i was on the van and i is and kind of the renaming was is really if you can get them to see the faults in the ball model and become just globe deniers i think that is sufficient and and somebody's on their own journey anyway and hopefully that that's that's the best way of coming to reality anyway but yeah get them as a globalist denier i think is sufficient for me yeah i think they all have to make their own decisions but uh there's help along the way and to do that all we've got to do is get them to honestly answer the housekeeping questions <laughs> you you can't be anything <laughs> other than a globe denier well i i use the top three housekeeping questions uh without even order that i thought in advance it was based on what the, what they said and how I responded and it just obviously I try to stay in the top three anyway because they're strong and uh, gravity didn't even come up until after the recording it was funny it just came up later after we stopped talking I thought they had to get to work and they kept talking but uh, right, as you've been then I just handle you've been compared what? to Morpheus 10th so do you remember the scene with the woman in the red dress yes can you remember how that scene starts? Uh, they're walking down the street, and uh, Neil turns around, and then next thing you know, an agent's attacking him. That's how it ends. The scene starts with Morpheus explaining to Neo that everybody who's around him... Now, just for a little interesting trivia fact, a lot of the people in that scene are twins. A lot of twins. If you look at it and pause it, you'll see. Nevertheless... He explains that most of the people who are in the system have no desire whatsoever to be woken up from the system. And not only that, they will fight vehemently to remain precisely as they are. That's how the scene starts. Yeah, I do recall that now. 
Um, the question is, when we're talking about these people, the people that you interviewed in the pre-show, now I don't know them, but we'll go on the assumption that they are actually normies. They're not, you know, considering themselves woke or bloody red or blue pill or whatever the bloody hell you're supposed to be if you're somehow not on what's the other one the people use non-player character or player character all these different terms that people use NPC. yeah 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 well there's just it's just a contrasting it's the same piss in a different bottle as far as i'm concerned if you're going to call yourself a player character because i'm involved i'm enlightened to this oh really well how do you know that you're not just on the other side of a different coin well, chances are you are. You're, you're buying into a different rhetoric. You're buying into a different system. Probably the same system. You just don't realise it. Anyway, that's the kind of message of The Matrix, if, if anybody doesn't realise that. He spends the entire movie trying to escape the system and then realises towards the end, although they hint at it when he starts, in the real world, in quotes, using magical powers on the machines. Well, that's because he's not in the real world. He's escaped one paradigm and just out of the frying pan, into the fire, into the next paradigm. All right, and that's all I see the normies, not that I'm claiming to be a player character where they're not. I'm just saying they won't want to escape into some sort of freedom of thought or some perceived enlightenment, right? And it was typified when Adam correctly pointed out, what do they want immediately? They want you to give them a new paradigm. Well, where's the, where's the new leader? Uh, where, what, you're saying I don't bow down to the sun anymore? It's not at the centre of my life. Well, what do I bow down to? That's what they say, right? Well, there is no hope for these people. I just laugh at them. And now I'm just going to be people who take offence. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it just I look at it and it just makes me laugh. The same with the current scenario. The current We're in 2020. I don't even have to name it, right? People know what's going on in 2020 when they look back on the history, however that may be written, <laughs> right? Well, you just, you look at your normie around you. Are you going to waste your breath? when they're terrified you can't help them they want to be terrified right well you just well, have to yeah just have to laugh i agree wanting to be terrified or just well, how i see them and how i even see the npc meme is these are all people that are that have been stuck too long in autopilot now normally you can't do that as long but society has almost basically engineered, been re-engineered to ac accommodate for people wanting to live on autopilot and not really think about it too deeply. And come stuck in it and they can't get out again. And that's what they really are afraid of. That's that fear, mysterious fear lurking around the corner. Hey, Arwen, what's NPC? Around. What's NPC, Arwen? Non-player character. Okay, thanks. It, but it is... To Might me, be. more like an autopilot. I, I know from my stats that are done. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Consciously figure things out, so they're just going with whatever it comes at hand. I know from my stats, I've got an older audience who may not get this reference right. So let's just break down what an, an NPC is. So non-player character, yes, that's right. Well, where's the reference from? Well, there's not. If you're in a computer game, there are two different types of interactions that you may have. Now, you may have an interaction with somebody who's actually got a mouse and keyboard in front of them. That would be a player character. Now, you also have interactions with programmed bots that can talk to you and you can interact with them, but ultimately they're just part of the, the process and the machine in the game. Those are non-player characters. Now, the insinuation is that there are yeah. people who are less woke that are, in our reality, non-player characters. They don't really have any involvement. They just go about their business as part of their routine. They're not aware of any of the things that are really going on around them. They're not woke enough, right? All this crap makes me cringe, I've got to be honest. But there we go. That's the they're just, breakdown. They're just following well, that's, that's why I'd like to refer to it rather as autopilot mode. Because those even NPC people could, under the right circumstances, if, they're, if they really have no other choice, they can actually be forced to wake up. But... Yeah, as long as society just makes it very easy for them to keep on going on autopilot mode and not think critically about it and still feel good about yourself, they will do their best to keep that habit going. Because it is like that. It is basically hiding their intellect from I themselves. They're, they're called, just go I, on the easy route. They're called, I think they're called oh, the so Proles. In, is it Proles in 1984? And Quantum Eraser calls them... Joe Coffee, Betty Breadmaker, you know, normies. That's what we're talking yeah. about. Just average Joe, normal. The guy who's 
watching his news. He goes to the bar on a Friday night. He watches his sports. Once every six months, he goes to a live game. He might occasionally catch a concert with his wife. She might occasionally go out to gym. That's normal normalcy. You know, your average Joe knows what we're talking about when we talk about a normie. As opposed to somebody who would sit... Uh, what time is it? Three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon debating the nature of reality. And after the fact, like yesterday, discuss the reifications of mathematics in terms of the current news situation. That's not a normie, right? But that doesn't make us in any way enlightened. In fact, in many ways, recognising how much you don't know makes me feel a lot less enlightened. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I was going to say that. It's time that a, you're wisening up. It, it, it's yeah, not well, the, a, a lifting it's, above it. it. It's a stepping away from it. So you don't know anymore, as you say. It, it, I always think of it more like kind of institutionalised prisoners. Uh, and that's that's the control they've they've got on us. We, we are institutionalised. We don't want to step out of it because it is uncomfortable when you step out there. You do have that shock. You don't know anything. That's not a comfortable feeling for anybody psyche to have to admit where you had a worldview where it was as horrible as it is it was comfortable because you thought it was true to step outside of that psychologically is uncomfortable and that's that process that you see the ballers fine with that's why they don't want to it's not a, it's not a, no one wants to be a flat earther do they it's not a, a great thing you just once you are honest with yourself then you are left with having to wait <laughs> <laughs> on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> hey, Adam, you said something interesting. Uh, they want something immediately, right? To replace what's happening right in front of their eyes or what they're contemplating. And a sure sign of that is the, the, uh, the trench people say, all right, show me a flat earth working model. They just want another model. Yeah, they want to replace an existing paradigm with a new paradigm. You know, it, it's a very different reaction, and I've, this is something I can say without doubt, that there is two different polar opposite attitudes when they come to, when people come to this subject. One will be, wow, man, isn't that exciting? I don't know anything about the sky. I wonder what it is. You know, kind of uplifted. There's a whole world of possibilities out there now. That's exciting. And then there's the other people who, oh, my God, we don't know what the sky is. Oh, what am I going to do? Well, I must blame someone <laughs> you know, for being lied to. It's terrible. Now they suddenly have to figure something out. They they can't just be told what it is anymore. And they get really outraged because uh, I want to just be told what it is. Yeah, people who want to go to NASA. Some people yeah, fight the now. Pick it, NASA, saying, tell us what it really is. <laughs> I don't know whether people want to find it. at the first onset, whether it is a reality um, of, of the subconscious kicking in to defend yourself. So you can stay institutionalized. But for me, the biggest part of that is the realization of a creator and the implications as opposed to the material world we live in where we're here and we're gone. So it doesn't matter what we do. That Actually, there's, there's real implications for you once you start to digest the reality of the lie um, why is there that, that to me is probably one of the biggest reasons to keep fighting and lying to yourself yeah definitely yeah the skeletons in the closet because even mm. if you don't necessarily process it in the forefront of your mind people aren't stupid in the back of their mind that logical connection is going to be made subconsciously and they're not even going to want that to creep into the forefront of their mind. So they keep their forf the forefront of their mind occupied by telling us we're idiots. <laughs> and that <laughs> relieves the pain and stops the onset of them recognising the consequences. And that there may be consequences for them. There may be the contemplation of an afterlife. If there's a creator, well, don't let that creep in. Right? No, no, no. It's all irrelevant. It's all meaningless. The skeletons in my closet, I can just forget about them. There's no consequences. And they're only lying to themselves, though. Uh, because of the the good old method on flat Earth ridicule, you know, <laughs> they'll they'll take that over the pain. My, my neighbor, I, I don't ever do that. You know, trying to convert people or what they call—I don't like the term at all. You know, flat smacking. 
I don't like that term at all. I, I don't do it myself. Uh, it's not something I kind of feel drawn to do. Um, I hate that. But my na- Sorry, Neil. I said I hate that term, flat smack. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it. This, I, whatever it is about it, I, I just never liked the term. But I, yesterday I did it. Uh, not intentionally, it was my neighbour, I spoke speaking to him, he started asking me about what I do and all the rest of it. We grew up, like, we living, I know him my whole life, like, and uh, I, I, I didn't go into all the nonsense about space or any rest of it, like, people, if they're going to speak to somebody about this, there's no point in trying to uh, debunk NASA and all this other stuff. Just keep it simple. I just told him, I knew he had been on an airplane, I knew he had had a long haul flight, more than one time. So I said, talk to them about airplanes. How can airplanes be in this, be doing this, if they're doing that? And he went, yeah. And I just said to him, I said, we have wind. We are breathing air. This is all pressurized. How do you have pressure with a container? Sorry, without a container. You know, I just kept it very simple. And he was like, yeah, and he was interested. And I gave, he wanted to know my YouTube channel. So I gave him my YouTube channel and Quantum Racer's YouTube channel. I said, I said, look at look at this one, Quantum Racer's channel. I said, I said he does good presentations. So, but you know, I don't try and push it on anyone or anything. So, if someone's going to ask about it, I'll keep it simple. Perfect. Quick shout out to Alexander for the super chat again. Gives me a thumbs up. Thank you very much indeed. With that, I will say a huge, massive, enormous thank you, first and foremost, to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. If you are watching on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Primary Streams, then stay tuned, as there will be an after show to follow. As I say, if you're watching live, this is where we bid you farewell. Another massive thank you to all of you smashed the super, smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out NathanOakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on either Primary Stream. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video.